All right. Well, it looks like we have a good amount of participants on, so we'll go ahead and get this show on the road. I want to first thank you all for joining us for today's presentation on Six Steps for Proper Industrial Water Tube Boiler Selection, brought to you by Cleaver Brooks. My name is Susan McCorby, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. And I want to mention a couple of things right off the bat. Um, if you'll notice on your WebEx control panel, there is a Q&A tool and a chat tool. I'd like, if you would, to use the Q&A tool. That way, if you have any issues with video or audio, we can make sure the appropriate people see your questions or your issues, and we can get that straighten, uh, straightened uh, and taken care of as quickly as possible. I uh, would like to say that we are going to have this today's presentation recorded, and it will be posted on our website, the Cleaver Books website, at www.cleaverbrooks.com forward slash webinars. So if you miss a portion of this or would like to refer it to others, uh, be sure to check out the archived event on the website. Today's presentation will last about 45 minutes give or take, and we'll have some time at the end for our questions uh, that we will direct to our expert panel. For those of you that are unfamiliar with what we do here at Cleaver Brooks, we offer uh, about eight to ten public webinars a year, and we are in the process right now of establishing next calendar year's uh, program, so I would like to invite you as the attendees and the participants to submit any topics that you would like to have Cleaver Brooks um, to give, you can do that by the survey that is available through the WebEx uh, tool as you exit today's presentation. So if you have a topic that you would like to hear us present, be sure to submit that. And also we look forward to your feedback. Uh, along with what we do on a month or almost monthly basis. We offer professional development hours, uh, a recommended one PDH hour for each of our presentations. So if you have not indicated through our registration process that you would like a certificate of attendance, please let us know at marketing at cleaverbooks.com and we'll make sure that we get a uh, we'll make sure that we get a certificate sent out to you for that. Um, with that, I would like to introduce to you Steve Connor. We actually have two people presenting today. We have Steve Connor and Jason Jacoby. Steve Connor has been with us, uh, Cleaver Brooks, for quite some time. He's got over 40 years of experience and in this industry and has been very instrumental in the development and advancement of the Cleaver Brooks training program. And then we have Jason Jacoby. Uh, Jason is a mechanical engineer with nearly 15 years of experience. His primary focus has been designing and quoting customized industrial water tube steam generating systems for the power and process applications. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and is a published author, having written articles and technical papers for various trade magazines over the past few years. So at the very end, we'll have uh, Steve and Jason available for your questions. And if you would, again, please direct your questions using the Q&A tool on your WebEx control panel. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Connor. Steve? Well, thank you very much, Susan. And, and thank again, thank you all for joining us again today. Um, we're going to do things a little differently. For those of you who have, uh, have gone to these webinars in the past, it's mostly me talking, and then we have other people who get involved at the very, very end. But in this particular one, we're going to involve Jason Jacoby uh, as part of the overall presentation. And the reason that I want to do that is because uh, even if you take a look at the pictures of both he and I, obviously he's much younger than I. But when we, when we look at uh, his experience, the 15 years that, uh, that Susan mentioned, it's 15 years in the trenches. So it's really not just his, his theory that he brings out of college, but he's been able to apply this empirically in the field working with, with specifying engineers. He's worked with uh, design build contractors and helping them develop, uh, develop a scope of supply or a specification. He's worked with facility engineers. He's worked with, uh, with riggers of these, of these large pieces of equipment, with the heavy haulers. So it's all the disciplines that are required to put in a successful 
large steam application is what Jason is able to do and what he brings to the party. So I thought the best thing to do to get us all on the same page would be to develop a scenario of a particular job. Now let's just picture yourself, everybody out there, and I know we've got some mechanical engineers, but everybody's a mechanical engineer. And a large food processor who's got multiple plants throughout the nation has come to your office, has come to your organization and said, look, I've got a problem here. I'm going to be looking at a number of firms, but I, I, I've narrowed it down to a couple of you. And here's my problem. I'm a Midwest canner. And I'm involved with specialties. I, I can soups, purees, vegetables, as I mentioned, things like that. And I'm looking to replace an old, inefficient coal-fired boiler. Now, this baby's been around here for about 35 or 40 years. And it was rated initially at 300,000 pounds per hour saturated. With a new IWT that I would like to replace it with, which would burn not coal, but natural gas and number two oil as a standby. Now, the reason that I'm replacing this is really, I've got three reasons. Number one, the, the border has reached the end of its useful life, and it's going to be requiring a substantial investment in the renewal. Number two, it's inefficient. And when it was put in 35, 40 years ago, we thought we were going to have a load of about 300,000 pounds per hour. It didn't really turn out to be that way. We didn't really have the expansion that we thought we were going to get. It's also only about 65% efficient. And thirdly, in order to comply with the recent EPA air quality standards, which we also refer to as MACT or the Maximum Achievable Control Technology, this limits the various emissions. So a switch the natural gas was eminent anyway. So those are the reasons that I'm coming to you. Now, it's estimated that the, uh, the new, more efficient boiler needs to produce about 200,000 pounds per hour, and it's going to operate at 250 pounds. And then this, this, this steam pressure is going to be reduced at various regulating stations uh, to accommodate specific processes and heating needs ranging from sterilization of hermetically sealed cans and trays of various vegetables, purees, soups, and stews. It's also going to be used for building heat and also CIP, clean in place. Now, the process equipment includes two large hydrostatic towers, which are primarily running size 404 cans of vegetables and purees. We also have two FMC continuous machines, which are running size 300 cans of mixed vegetables and soups. And then we also have 20 batch retorts for sterilizing institutional sized cans, like number 10 cans, also trays of specialty soups, stews, and cream corn. Now, some of these batch retorts are rotating type, others are, others are still. Now, depending on the time of year and the late summer or early fall pack, the steam requirements will hold fairly steady at about 160,000 pounds per hour through nine months of the year. But for the three months of August, September, and October, the load will increase by about 40,000 pounds to reach the 200,000 pound per hour max. Now, also note that during the year, the plant throughput will vary based on production demand, product run, the can sizes or tray sizes, fill temperatures, ITs, and CIP requirements. So we've got a varied load here. This will seriously impact the steam demands, causing the load to swing fairly rapidly at times. This is especially the case in the fall of the year during the pack when all the retorts are in operation and the products running through them will vary considerably. So this is what I have. Now, the engineering firm took a look at this. They assigned an engineer to the job, and obviously it was very important that that engineer find out more about what this job is all about, find out more about the load and its characteristics. Well, what they found is that they have existing piping. Now, this piping's been here for 35 or 40 years, and even though it looks good, it's all insulated and it's capped, we don't know what's going on inside that piping. It could be weakened. And because of that, we could be running into some other operational problems. So we have to be aware of that. Also, we find that we have an old building, and access to this building is going to be very difficult. 
We've got to go through a, a little town. Uh, we've got some access issues that we're going to have to confront. And also the customers told us very, very succinctly and very firmly that the budget is tight. So the amount of access, access ways into the building and out of the building have to be kept to a minimum. They also looked at field erecting but decided that that was going to be too costly. Now, we also have an old masonry stack here that's been around for as long as the border has. And that also has to be used because we don't want to spend any additional money on, on a stack. On a positive note, the deaerator and the chemical feed system was just recently replaced within the last couple of years, and it's certainly fine for a 200,000 uh, pound per hour border to support that. The other thing the engineer found out, which is very, very important during this probing process, is the operating staff, many of these guys are going to be retiring fairly soon. In fact, some have. The problem is they're going to be replaced with people who are not as experienced. And they're not going to replace all of them. So they're going to allow attrition to take place here so they can control their operating costs. And the other thing is that they're going to ask these people who have now taken over this, this operation, these border operators, to do more than just operate the border. They want them to multitask and uh, be able to perform some other maintenance tasks. Now, Along with this, obviously, they're cutting the maintenance budget, not just by reducing the staff, but they're trying to keep that maintenance budget as low as they possibly can. And they want to reduce their fuel costs by a minimum of 20%, while at the same time reducing their NOx requirements to 20 parts per million, because that would be that is what is, is going to be mandated for their particular locale and their particular capacity that the effluent coming out of that stack. So they've got to get down to 20 parts per million NOx, but they're looking at maybe getting it down to as low as nine parts per million or less. Take the differences and sell those credits on the open market. Use those proceeds to reduce operational cost. They also want to hold CO, carbon monoxide, at 50 parts or less. They'd like to see zero. So, Jason, that's the can of worms, or should I say can of spaghetti, that we are now handing to you, asking you what you would do as an engineer, given this problem, to come up with a very, very good specification for this customer that will, that will go long-term delivering all the needs and satisfying this customer for years to come. Because remember, it's a, mul it's a large company that has multiple plants. So there's a lot of potential business for this engineering firm in the future. What would you do, Jason? Well, Steve, uh, to begin with, uh, the scenario you've outlined is not an uncommon one. And... Uh, uh, but definitely not uh, one that is insurmountable. So, uh, you know, I think we can break this down into six very simple steps. Uh, the first one being determining the steam and process load needs, which, which you've identified. Um, two, uh, footprint and site issues need to be evaluated. Three, specification considerations need to be looked at, and these would be uh, a, a wish list from the, from the end user. Four, Emissions requirements, of course, have to be looked at uh, with things like boiler mac and, and, and BACT um, uh, issues uh, with the EPA. Uh, we, this is first and foremost on our minds. Uh, number five is, of course, shipping considerations and logistics. Uh, you know, can we or cannot we get the boiler there? And once it's there, can we even get it in the building? And uh, step six is economic considerations. Of course, at the end of the day, does it make sense to, to do this? So. Let's start with number one. Uh, you know, we're going to look at the steam and process load needs. So Steve stated early in uh, the presentation that we have a requirement for 200,000 pound an hour at a pressure of 250 pounds. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm assuming for the, the moment that we do not have a need for superheat, as this appears to be a saturated steam application, uh, which most food canners are. But 
Uh, as a consulting engineer, be sure you, you double check that uh, there's not a requirement for superheat. For instance, if they're doing some kind of combined heat and power or, or uh, other generation on site uh, for the process. So anyway, in any instance, uh, uh, we're going to have rapid load uh, swings um, is what Steve mentioned. And, and uh, we need to take a look at how we're going to handle that because various system users are going to be turning on and off based on demand. And uh, in this case, if, if I were the engineer writing the spec, you know, I would first consider a three-element feedwater control system, um, first and foremost, to better ensure a stable water level in the upper drum of the boiler. So if you look at the slide on your screen here, if we focus on the right side, um, that's showing a control scheme which is monitoring and responding to three separate inputs. Uh, number one would, would be drum level, number two would be steam flow, and number three would be feed water flow. Now, which are all important in the regulation of, you know, introduction of feed water versus steam flow out the nozzle. And as such, you know, maintaining a constant level in the drum where the process load changes rapidly. So a three-element three control system is pretty standard on uh, industrial water tube boilers to start with. But if, if, you're, if you have an older system in place uh, that was put in many, you know, maybe even decades, many decades ago, uh, it may not have this and, and it may not be something you're used to, but this is pretty standard. But don't, don't uh, settle for anything less if you're going to have any kind of load swings. The next thing I would specify to accommodate these conditions is a 10 to 1 turn down burner. Uh, in the case of a 200,000 pound hour boiler, a 10 to 1 burner will allow the boiler to reduce its output to 20,000 pound an hour um, before cycling offline. You simply divide by 10. Uh, this will be critical for tracking the load during process variability and during those high demand months when the plant is engaged in processing the seasonal vegetable pack, which adds another 40,000 pound an hour to the load. Now, also, along with the turndown, you want to make sure that the boiler can respond properly to ramp rate. So uh, a typical ramp rate for an industrial water tube boiler is 20% of the uh, MCR, or maximum continuous rating, per minute. So you want to make sure you specify that the boiler is capable of 20% of ramp, ramp rate as well as 10 to 1 turndown. Now, Steve, when you went through the scenario on this job, you indicated that the customer is going to maintain old steam piping for budgetary purposes. That, you know, yeah, that's not uncommon. Piping is piping, right? Not true. Uh, this is kind of a red flag to me because in my experience, um, a lot of this piping, uh, well, well, we have, we have no idea actually uh, how this piping is. Some of it could be in good shape, some of it may not be. Um, the problem we're worried about here is uh, a phenomenon called water hammer. Um, therefore, I would make sure and specify a boiler that's able to produce uh, high-quality steam with a moisture content out the nozzle not exceeding one-half of 1% 1 moisture or 99.5% dry steam uh, to mitigate that problem. You, um, if you look at the next slide here, uh, in this picture you see uh, a diagram showing a cross-section of a steam drum inside an industrial water tube boiler. Uh, what's your you see here at the bottom is the steam generating tubes that uh, uh, basically the steam bubbles into the drum. Uh, it's directed into the volume above the water line, which is the yellow area you see. And then it's introduced into a labyrinth or a chevron style separator where the, the steam goes, endures a torturous path through which the uh, water droplets are knocked off, allowing only a small amount of moisture to exit. And that's the mechanism inside the drum for which to um, to do that. So make sure that you specify proper drum internals to achieve this. Uh, just settling for an old-fashioned dry pipe, for instance, is not necessarily a, a, a good uh, solution to ensure dry steam. So, uh, Excuse me, Jason. I, I, I had an idea that you were going to be talking about water hammer. And what I did is I, I buried a slide in your deck there. Maybe you could bring it out um, at this time, it, it talks about water hammer. It's got several images on it. I'd like to. That's it. That's the one. Oh, Thank clever. you. <laughs> that's pretty clever, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> anyway, if, if we take a look at water hammer, um, there are three types, and we talked about this in a previous webinar. But you, you've got uh, hydraulic, thermal, and differential. What I'm concerned about is the differential water hammer in this particular case. So if we take a look at that. That, uh, that slide up in the upper left-hand uh, upper left -hand corner, the animated slide, you can see how water will pool at the bottom of a, let's, let's say it's a steam distribution pipe, a header pipe, and as that condensate begins to build, it'll begin to form and block that pipe. So let's just picture, we're talking 250 pounds of operating pressure here, right? 
So we've got a velocity in that pipe which is approaching or over 100 miles an hour. Now remember, water weighs 8.3 pounds per gallon. Let's just envision, if you will, that we've got a bowling ball and it's flying down that pipe at 100 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, somebody begins to open up a valve to allow a certain amount of steam to enter into another process, and bang, that bowling ball slams into that valve, or maybe it's a weakened piece of pipe, a 90 degree angle, or a 45, and everything comes unbuttoned. Remember, that's 250 pounds. All the water that's in that pipe, and you could have 14 inch headers here, flashes into steam, expands 1,600 times, and scalds everything in its path. That's exactly what happened in New York City on July 18, 2007. We thought it was another 9-11 attack. It wasn't. It was water hammer. There was a truck right near that hole that you see there. It was a service truck. It was blown 20 feet in the air. And the poor guy in the truck was scalded and burned with first, second, and third degree burns. People panicked and ran. A woman got so stressed she had a heart attack and died. So water hammer is nothing to fool with. If we're talking 250 pounds steam, we're talking in excess of 400 degrees. 130 degrees will scald you. So I know I get a little dramatic about this, but it's so important. When you're in a plant and you hear banging in the pipes, and you see pipes that are kind of swinging, and people dismiss it saying, well, that's been going on all the time. It shouldn't. That's water hammer. That's dangerous. Jason, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I just thought I had to inject this. No, no, that was been, no, that's great, Steve. That is exactly where I was going with that. Was, uh, I, I don't think I could have said it better, so I, I think I'll move on. Um, uh, going back to the, the cyclic load, uh, the next thing I'm concerned with uh, is the conductivity level on the boiler. Uh, we need to keep it within specific ranges to avoid foaming or priming in the upper drum, which cause carryover and it adversely affects the process as well um, by adding to the possibility of the water hammer that Steve just talked about. So in this case, we're looking at holding tolerances for things like hardness, alkalinity, and, and TDS, or total dissolved solids in the feed water while maintaining a specific conductance, le sorry, conductance level, uh, which is measured in microohms. So uh, on the screen here, uh, I'm showing a specific chart showing the various levels uh, one should attempt to, attempt to maintain, and of course, uh, abiding by the recommendations from a reputable chemical engineer or supplier who is dealing with the customer specific situation um, is, uh, is important. But in general, most people follow uh, ABMA or American Boiler Manufacturers Association uh, water quality table that you see here um, for saturated steam applications. Now the American Society of Mechanical Engineers or ASME uh, also has published what they call Table 1 which is uh, good for superheated steam applications particularly dealing with those for power um, in which the steam is used to spin turbines. So as a consulting engineer make sure you understand what's going on and um, the the purpose of the steam and determine which table you want to go with. So the next uh, evaluation step that I talked about earlier, number two, was footprint and site issues. So uh, the first thing, uh, if I would be the specifying engineer, is looking at building access. So this is the same picture we showed a little bit ago, and um, here you can see a, a building with some pretty challenging access issues. Uh, and since we know the budget is tight, negotiating or negotiating these issues without overspending is going to be difficult. So, you know, what you're looking at is a building in a in a you know in the middle of a city on a tree-lined street. You know, it, it's a brick building, so we we can't do a whole lot of demo to get the boiler in and out. Um, but uh, that being said, we are removing an old coal boiler, so the best thing to do, in my mind at least, is at least take advantage of that. And however we get the old boiler out of there, we should plan on putting the new boiler back in the same way. Now once inside the building, we have to consider any interfa interferences in the way of bringing the new boiler into place. Now certainly we want to limit the expense, so engaging a competent rigger, as Steve mentioned early on, uh, can be worth its weight in gold, uh, thereby minimizing uh, walls, removal, and machinery modifications and movement. This, this picture on the screen here is a perfect example of a typical boiler room that we're used to walking around. And as you can see, there's not a lot of room for movement, and there's support beams for the building, there's piping overhead, 
uh, other utilities, uh, pipe ga natural gas fuel piping, uh, lighting in the way. So there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, it's not so easy just to unplug one boiler and put another one in. So we need to look at those logistics with the customer very closely. Um, now that we know that we're going to physically get the boiler into the building, assuming we've done that, uh, we need to think about you know, the maintenance requirements. Uh, the boiler footprint and the space around it uh, is, is crucial. For instance, um, Steve related earlier that the new boiler was to be equipped with a dual firing capability, which means it's going to fire natural gas or number two oil backup. If you're firing a fuel oil, this means that your boiler is going to need to be equipped with an oil gun, number one, and, and possibly slip blowers if you're going to fire oil often or if it's heavy oil. So remember, um, you know, we we're talking about a 200,000 pound hour boiler here, so that's over, you know, that's about 40 foot long actually. So you're going to have uh, an oil gun retract length that's probably, you know, in the 12 foot length range, and you're going to have slip blowers on each side of the boiler uh, that need to be pulled, and, and they're going to be, they'll come in from both ends, from the front and back, and, and meet in the middle, so they're about 20 foot long each. So you got quite a bit of uh, room that you need to allow for for these maintenance poles. Now, that's not to say the, the building needs to be made 20 foot longer. Uh, there's a lot of ways around this. Most customers will uh, uh, position the boiler in such a way that there's a window or a door nearby that, to allow for these to be pulled through when necessary, or maybe, maybe uh, even uh, um, you know the boilers up on a mezzanine or something where it can clear between other equipment or something. But you, that needs to be thought about because it's crucial to be able to get to the oil gun, especially it's going to need to be pulled uh, for cleaning occasionally and the soot blowers every so often. Now the considerations involving the footprint are looking closely at the area in which the boiler will be placed. Uh, you know, we need to ensure adequate space for walk around the boiler, uh, main, you know, for maintenance such as casing and tube replacement or burner repair and adjustments. Uh, we need to look at ceiling height to accommodate boiler piping, you know, valving, and, and, and an economizer, which is al almost always part of an industrial water tube anyway. Uh, this also includes overhead restrictions, such as ducting or, or uh, pipe racks. Um, even uh, nowadays, you got Ethernet and communications uh, wiring running right through the, the boiler room, too, in the ceiling. There's also the floor loading requirement, and if the floor is substantial enough to hold the weight of the new unit um, and, and where the pilings are. And what about seismic? Uh, that's important too. Um, and wind loading, if you, if you have a stack, uh, a new freestanding stack as part of the system, uh, you're going to have to look at uh, the wind loading and the, if the floor can support that. Uh, in this case, we're using an existing stack, um, but that's something to consider too. And, and, and of course, speaking of the existing stack, um, we do need to reuse the existing masonry chimney for cost reasons, and that's not uncommon. And, a lot of cases, these chimneys are kind of pillars of the community, if you pardon the expression. And so, you know, people would hate to see them knocked down. They've been around for a long time, and they're kind of an architectural uh, thing to look at. So, um, but this is this is fine as long as it's structurally sound and the inside is not overly compromised. We we have to consider the draft conditions with this chimney. If it's really high, uh, we might have to install some draft control on the boiler, and um, you know, because it's insu insufficient draft means there'll be poor combustion, you know, sooting, compromise safety and that. So an analysis needs to be done on this chimney to make sure that it's going to be okay. Now again, referencing site conditions, uh, we need to think about things like utilities, you know, water, fuel, sewer, and electrical. Uh, in many existing uh, retrofits, uh, like we're talking about today, we find a, you know, a motor control center, for instance, will, will need to be looked at, uh, where the high-powered three-phase three, sorry, three-phase voltage enters along with the step down or separate lower voltages to various you know motors, valves, and actuators. Now, this needs to be closely checked to assure proper voltages and breakers exist to properly power the new boiler. Uh, this is especially uh, important today with uh, the new ultra low NOx um, boiler designs which have slightly larger fans than the older units. So you need to make sure that you have enough capacity in your MCC to cover the larger fan motor requirements. Now this also goes for fuel and fuel pressure requirements. Um, you know, to, to achieve the ultra low NOx emissions, a lot of times higher gas pressures are required than may be existing, so that needs to be looked at as well. So make sure and, and check that out. Now I just mentioned number two oil was going to be used for standby. Uh, in this case, either an oil storage tank exists above ground or below, or it needs to be added. 
In either case, environmental considerations referenced in local codes need to be researched and complied with. And an appropriately sized and constructed tank needs to be furnished, which is in accordance with these standards. So that's very important, uh, you know, with a, from a local standpoint. And finally, with regard to site considerations, we need to consider the actual removal of the old asset. Steve indicated at the outset of the presentation that it had been decided to remove the existing coal boiler. And I'm assuming, you know, it will not be used again, but dismantled and scrapped, uh, torched out, quite literally. And uh, the contents will exit through the same openings required for the new boiler install. So obviously in the case of an old coal boiler, the dismantling is going to be labor intensive and asbestos abatement is going to be involved. And that can be a major concern for customers. So don't forget uh, to look into that for sure. Now considerable planning has to go into this phase, coordinating the placement of the new boiler so as to limit the amount of downtime. This is often over a weekend or a planned shutdown period. Uh, to do the changeover. So uh, just a quick picture on your screen here and an example of a new package boiler being uh, rigged into place into an existing plant um, gives you an idea of just uh, what we're talking about here. So uh, let's move on to the next evaluation step. It's what I call the specification consideration step. Now uh, this is basically where uh, you, you've sat with the customer and they've basically given you uh, their list of uh, you know lessons learned from the previous boiler or, or their wish list if you will and uh, things that you know you as a consulting engineer need to make sure to write into the spec to make sure that all the boiler vendors uh, comply with um, the last thing you want is for you, for this installation to be put in and, and a year down the road the customers like well if we had to do this again we would do X differently you know we, we want to get it right the first time so we need to really look at the specification requirements that and, and understand what the customer is looking for. So for instance, uh, improving efficiency, uh, they're asking us to you know, reduce fuel costs by at least 20%. Now this is surely a directive from the accountants, I, I imagine, uh, that this is what's going to make the project feasible. This is going to be part of the return on investment or the ROI. And you know, first and foremost in this scenario anyway, we're changing from coal to gas, so that's going to be a huge savings right there. But uh, the other thing we need to consider is the type of control system to make sure that even the, the new gas boiler is going to be as efficient as possible. And, and along those lines, I would recommend a full metering uh, control system with cross-limiting and O2 trim. Now this is uh, doesn't only improve the combustion efficiency, but also the safety as well with air always leading fuel. Um, th this, this is a diagram on your screen. I'm not going to go into this uh, for the sake of time, but uh, we, we can certainly answer questions later. Um, more importantly, though, than the actual control strategy, when it comes to efficiency, is a stack economizer. Um, what the, the economizer does is it preheats the boiler feed water coming from the deaerator uh, before entering the boiler by using the boiler gas exit temperature, um, basically absorbing the heat from the hot gases before they go to the stack and are released to atmosphere. Now, an economizer can very easily add 2 to 3 or even 4 percent efficiency. Uh, especially at the operating pressure of 250 uh, pounds, the stack temperature will be well over 500 degrees. So um, you can imagine this is a major uh, efficiency gain over time. In fact, for large industrial water tubes, the return on the investment is really a no-brainer because for this, the insignificant cost of an of a economizer, which is maybe 5-10% of the overall price, um, it, it pays for itself within a year in most cases or, or no less than no more than two. So, you know, 95% of the industrial water tubes uh, that I've I've worked on uh, all have economizers. So that's almost a, a given for sure. Now, another important thing that came up during the customer, you know, interviews was the maintenance budget was going to be reduced. So the engineer needs to keep maintenance requirements in mind when putting the spec together. Now, in this case, my recommendation for sure would be for the engineer to consider specifying a boiler with membrane construction. And what that is, is this photo is actually showing that is it's a boiler that is basically uh, eliminated um, of refractory where the, the tubes and the fins between the boiler tubes are welded together forming a gas tight seal, uh, eliminating the need for refractory. Uh, in fact, this next photo probably better shows that um, uh, by showing a view from inside the furnace uh, of an older refractory design where you can see the refractory burner throat and the refractory on the floor to a newer modern design where it's the burner throat is refractory free and the front wall is uh, all membrane construction. 
The next thing to consider when looking at these maintenance costs is to make sure that uh, the front and rear walls are refractory free completely. Uh, if you look on the left of your screen here, the top picture shows the older boiler designs uh, where it was literally brick and mortar was used versus on the lower left there, the, the uh, membrane design, which is welded construction, zero maintenance, and uh, it's a water-cooled rear wall. Where the, where the, when I say water-cooled, that's the feed water going through the boiler is what is um, cooling those tubes. So it's a natural circulation, so there's no separate water source required, just to be clear. Um, but you also want to look at access openings. Uh, is, that's another important thing for maintenance. So on the right side of your screen here, we're showing just a couple views of the type of openings that uh, are required. On the water side, on the right, on the right side of the screen, we're showing uh, access to the drum manways. Uh, you can see on the top right there, um, that that's a guy's job that uh, I, I personally wouldn't uh, want to have, but if you want to sign up for it, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of openings. Um, but that's definitely uh, a tight trike tight quarters, excuse me, and uh, you want to specify as large openings as you can get to make sure that it's easy for your operators uh, to get in and out uh, during outages and do inspections. And then also at the bottom left there, you'll see uh, that's a furnace access door there, that dark uh, rectangular area. And you want to look at the size of that too, make sure that that's uh, adequate for the type of operators that you have. Now the other thing uh, that Steve mentioned uh, was that the operator's experience level uh, was not only low, but the number of them have been reduced and their tasks are going to be increased. You know, you use the term multitasking. Uh, it's not a good situation, but you know, this is, this is the way the world's going these days. But the good news is that we have technology today which can mitigate this kind of problem. Um, basically, the technology can perform the tasks that the operators used to do. Um, what I'm, what I'm talking about here is a, a PLC-based uh, control system with remote instrumentation and a touchscreen interface, um, which basically, uh, through Ethernet communication, sends all the signals to a central control room where a single operator can monitor most all the critical functions of the boilers. And if there's a problem, of course, can dispatch a guy uh, you know, to go out and check things out or, or make a, a, sh a routine shift uh, inspection. But uh, you don't have to be standing next to the boiler uh, all day long in order for it to uh, to be operating properly because we have these technologies. So um, the PLC systems have a burr management and combustion controls integrated into a common platform and uh, this basically allows the operator uh, the ability to record and trend conditions, review faults and alarms, and uh, so, you know it sends all this information to a plethora of receivers including pagers, computers, tablets, and smartphones. Uh, you name it, uh, there's all sorts of technology out there that can make uh, running these boilers a lot smoother than it used to be. Now we'll move on to step four, and that's a very important one. That's emissions uh, requirements. And as you know, uh, with today's EPA requirements uh, becoming ever more stringent, especially uh, when it comes to BACT, which is best available control technology, and most recently, boiler MACT, which is uh, uh, the same along the same lines, uh, this is deserving of its own step in our process. When addressing boiler emissions today, you know we're primi primarily concerned with the limitation of NOx or nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide or CO. Now there are other pollutant considerations too, but but NOx and CO are the primary ones when burning the most common fuel, which is natural gas. So um, you don't need to be concerned about too many of the others uh, unless you're firing a solid fuel or maybe an oil. So as a specifying engineer, um, I would recommend that you specify as low NOx a burner as you can because you're probably going to be forced into it anyway, so you might as well just do it out of the chute. And uh, the way to do that is to specify an ultra low NOx burner. Um, burn technology exists out there uh, to do as low as 9 ppm NOx uh, with just the burner, and that's using what's called flue gas recirculation, or FGR. But you can also pair that with selective catalytic reduction, or SCR. Uh, so what you can do is you can use the FGR um, built into the burner to lower the NOx to a certain level, say 20 ppm or less, and then you can add an FCR to it, and it'll do a 90% a reduction. So you can go from, say, this 20 ppm down to 2 ppm NOx, which is uh, starting to be regulated in some of the, the uh, certain regions of the country that are affected by things like uh, BACT and Boiler Max. So the two can operate in tandem, and you can really... Uh, 
capitalize on your emissions trades by lowering your NOx levels. So one thing that should be noted, though, is that the SCR does involve uh, a reactant, which is ammonia, and it's injected into the flue gas stream uh, at the boiler gas exit where the temperatures are, are proper for the ammonia to react with the rare metal catalyst of the SCR. And um, that allows it to reduce the NOx into simple nitrogen and water. Um, so just be aware that if you do go the SCR route, you need to look out for safety and permitting issues because ammonia storage can be a dangerous thing. Uh, it's anhydrous or aqueous ammonia is typically what's used. And there's a pros and cons to either one, but um, if you're in a highly populated area or in a downtown area and they don't already have ammonia uh, procedures in place, uh, then it could be an issue. A lot of old coal boilers already have an SCR on them, so in this scenario, we probably got a uh, ammonia system in place, but we need to definitely look into that because if, a SC, if ammonia storage can't be used, we need to consider just doing the ultra low NOx with the burn technology. And finally, with regard to, regard to emissions reduction, uh, we need to make sure that the furnace in which the burner is firing has adequate volume uh, to, you know, not overly propagate the NOx. So uh, I got a couple terms here I've added uh, to, for you to look at. The first is volumetric heat release, and that is a measure of the uh, BTU input of the burner um, per hour divided by the cubic footage. Now this is a, a tool used to evaluate combustion volume and uh, it, it actually is an, it's an old tool that was used um, primarily uh, back in the solid fuel firing days um, to, to determine if a furnace was uh, properly sized for residence time of the solid fuel. Um, it's not as important for gas fired boilers anymore. Uh, the burner uh, manufacturers will look at it and, and, and use it to some extent, but it doesn't really have much to do with how to select a, a, a gas-fired boiler nowadays. What we really look at is what's called furnace heat absorbed, which is the BTUs per hour per, per square foot. And that, you know, unlike volumetric heat release, which is an indirect method to evaluate the, the furnace and the, the metal temperatures, the heat absorbed is actually a direct tool that can be used to you know, measure the actual temperature of the tubes in the furnace. And the purpose of a consulting engineer for, for specifying a certain heat release rate is to try and uh, make sure to get a boiler that he feels will last uh, for a long time. So if you're going to you know, go down the route of trying to specify a heat release uh, for a boiler, you really should look at specifying a heat absorbed number instead, which is in square footage instead of a cubic foot number, because that's what really determines the life, lifetime of the boiler. So, so moving on to, to step five here, I better keep moving on. Uh, uh, we need to uh, look at shipping, and uh, especially for boilers of this size, which are 200,000 pounds an hour, um, it can be shipped on a truck, rail, or even a barge. Uh, but the point is, they're shipped as packages. You know, so this minimizes the amount of field labor to get the system operational. But in order to do that, uh, you need these packages get pretty large. Uh, you know, we do as much shop assembly as we can, but then we end up with uh, a pretty good sized package. So the logistics of getting these boilers to where they need to go is is pretty intensive, and involves uh, you know some costly transportation in some instances, and even you know state and local authorities. So the prudent specifying engineer who's looking out for the overall budget needs to be aware of this at least to the extent of questioning you know, a reputable heavy hauler who's familiar with heavy wide loads like you see here. Um, and what has to be considered, uh, including things like Department of Transportation restrictions, you know, as you go across the country and ship one of these boilers from its point of origin, you're going to pass through all sorts of states or if you're going into Canada uh, or, or elsewhere, you need to look at all those different uh, authorities and what they're going to require. Uh, height and width restrictions, uh, utilities, uh, power lines need to be moved, uh, stoplights if you're going into a downtown area, downtown area might have to be removed temporarily, uh, you're going to have permitting, um, permits have to be issued, police escorts, etc. So uh, these are key issues that can impact uh, the timing on the job as well and we need to be cognizant of that. So uh, shipping logistics is a major concern. Now another uh, question which often arises is where does the manufacturer uh, responsibility begin and, and then the buyers uh, end, or I'm sorry, end and the buyers begin. I apologize. Now, the answer is often once the boiler is, arrives at the front door 
and it's offloaded, the responsibility transfers to the owner. But it should be noted that there are reputable and competent OEMs um, that are very familiar with the evaluation steps mentioned so far and can be of considerable help in answering many of the questions and consulting uh, uh, with you on how best to do this because there's, there's many ways to do it. You can rail a boiler, you can truck a boiler, you, you know, we can do the crane, you cannot do the crane. So uh, make sure you evaluate that. So that leaves us with the final step, which is, of course, the important one, which is economics. Uh, as we've gone through this scenario, uh, with the five steps so far, we've now come to, I guess, where the rubber meets the road, and that is which boiler is the best. So we've, you know, we've looked at um, ways to increase performance and efficiency, as you see here, um, as well as uh, client-specific requests, like reducing maintenance and, uh, and improving access. Uh, but again, we haven't really looked at what what is the best boiler for the job because there are options out there. Um, the main types of industrial water tube boilers are what you see here, the D-type, the O-type, and the A-type. And we need to take, I guess, a quick look at these and try and figure out, well, which one is the best for this job? So here's a quick view of the D-type boiler. Now, it's available up to 225,000 pound an hour in rail shippable form anyway. And um, so that'll, that'll fit for this scenario. Uh, it's a good boiler, as you can see, it's, it's a little legend at the bottom there um, for heating applications, process, you know, auxiliary boiler service, or even power. Um, this is a process application, so it, uh, it, it'll definitely fit that our scenario today. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the closer view or cross section view, you can see that it's called a D style boiler, just just so you know, because the furnace forms the shape of a letter D. It's really, we're not very creative in the boiler industry, but that's that's as simple as it gets. So. The furnace is on the left side of this diagram, and the, and the generating tubes are on the right side. And uh, the, the D-style is by far the most economical boiler because it's a two-drum design, and it's got uh, three membrane walls uh, versus the uh, four on the other design. So it's pretty ideal for nearly any steam need and would be a good selection, um, in my opinion. Now we can also look at an O-style boiler. Uh, O-style boilers are available up to 250,000 pounds an hour just a little bit bigger than the D in rail shippable form. And the reason that is is because they're symmetrical in shape and so you can get a little little bigger and taller unit on a rail car and still have it fit through a tunnel. Uh, but as you can see at the bottom there, uh, the O-style boiler is uh, not necessarily a good fit for power application, um, but we're not concerned about that today because we're doing a process application. But just keep that in mind if you are doing a power application. The reason that is is because uh, if it's a power application, you're probably going to have superheat, and so uh, the the size of the O style furnace uh, is is shaped like an O. It's not the largest furnace of the three, and it makes it hard to uh, fit a superheater in there. Uh, one more thing on the O style boiler is that the it's uh, has a vertical gas outlet, and so the gas outlet uh, is ideal um, when space is tight. And I mean space, I mean width. Um, because the gas outlets on the top, that means the stack in the economizer, if you use one, is directly above the boiler instead of off to the side. So that is, uh, if space is a concern, definitely look at an O-type boiler. And an O-style boiler it would be a perfect fit for this application as well. So that would be a good one to use. But it does cost more than a D. Uh, so, so far we, we might lean towards the D. But one last one to look at is the A-style. Now that A-style is similar to the O, except it's a three-drum design, and what that does is that allows for a larger furnace and even more capacity in a rail shippable boiler, and it is available up to 275,000 pounds an hour. And it, like the D boiler, it's a, it also will do power applications because it can easily accommodate superheat. So if you look at the cross-section here, you can kind of see how the furnace is sort of the shape of an A, uh, that's where it gets its name again, and it's uh, much bigger than the O style, so it allows you to get higher uh, uh, capacities in the same footprint. But there is a drawback to the A boiler, and that, and because it's got another drum and a uh, fourth membrane wall, it is more expensive. Um, so again, unless you've got a space constraint, um, the A style boilers uh, shouldn't be your first choice, but it definitely uh, can give you the most steam in the smallest footprint and ship by rail. So now that we've looked at that, uh, in my own opinion, uh, and maybe hopefully the audience agrees, I think for this application, uh, which is a process application with low pressure saturated steam, the D-style boiler is our winner. It's the most economical, 
it costs the least, and uh, we don't have a space constraint concern because we're removing an old coal boiler that had a lot of, uh, much larger than this, so we should be good to go. Uh, it has uh, uh, refractory free construction like we talked about. It's got, we can uh, put big manways on it to allow for the access the customer wanted. And uh, it's able to be configured in a right or left hand configuration uh, to best fit uh, where the stack needs to go. One thing I do want to bring up though is that uh, keep in mind that some manufacturers do have standard off the shelf boilers uh, with a fixed set of options. Um, and those boilers can be a lot lower priced. So uh, cost was a very big concern for this scenario. So if, uh, if you find yourself running into uh, a cost issue when you're, uh, let's say you specify a boiler and you start getting the bids in and they get, the, you know, for, you know, say budgetary bids, and they're starting to look like they're a little over what the customer can spend, be sure to ask if the manufacturer's got a standard offering because um, those boilers are, uh, uh, no different in quality, but they 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 are uh, lower in price because uh, you're able to um, uh, standardize on the the engineering, reduce the man hours involved. Uh, you have purchasing agreements with certain sub vendors, so you buy in bulk. Uh, same with the the raw materials and things like that. So that's a way that uh, you can reduce cost if you're not uh, if if a custom designed D A or O type boiler is uh, just not going to work out for you. So anyway, I guess that those are the six evaluation criteria that I see to properly select and specify a boiler for the scenario you presented, Steve, and I, uh, if you're still with us, uh, I guess I'll ask, do you have anything else to add? Well, no, I don't, Jason. I think you covered the waterfront very, very well, and I, and I appreciate that uh, very much. I, I, what I want to do just at the end here is summarize some of the key points that you made, and we'll just go through the six steps. Determine the steam and process load needs. That's number one that the engineer has to really get into it. It's, it's a number of conversations, but you have to find out what's really going on with that process load and, and, and what can we do to make sure that we've got a long-term, uh, very, very effective uh, choice as far as our boiler and ancillary equipment is concerned to satisfy those needs. Uh, footprint and site issues that you, that you mentioned, both outside and inside the building, I think that's all self-explanatory, but very important that you understand that uh, we find out what the utilities are. What do we have available to us? And, and uh, what about gas pressure? What about gas, uh, the quantity of gas? You know, for, as, as, as um, Jason mentioned, you know, if we get into some of these low knock situations, that gas pressure is going to go up. So we've got to make sure that we've got an adequate pressure to be able to hit those numbers that we're looking for. Specification considerations, he looked at efficiency expectations. We looked at those. Maintenance issues. We uncovered the fact that we've got people who are retiring. We've got people who are not very well uh, uh, maybe equipped uh, as far as a knowledge base is concerned. We have to look after that. That's going to be the customer's concern, but I think the consulting engineer has to bring that to their attention. Uh, emissions. These things are getting bigger and bigger every day. And, and, of course, we always think of California, Texas, Louisiana, places like that. Maybe New Jersey is being very strict. No, it's starting to, it's starting to pass throughout the entire country. Uh, where these large uh, uh, area sources or major sources uh, have to look at what these emission requirements are now as far as the government is concerned and comply with those. Shipping, huge issue right here. Shipping is huge and, and often forgotten about. Let's just worry about the, the proper boiler that we're going to specify for the job. But remember, we've got a limited budget, and that shipping can be extremely costly, and it's got to be thought through. So maybe the consulting engineer is not the one that gets into the weeds on this, but certainly is a, a, a good responsible engineer is going to bring this to the light of the customer so they, they make sure they understand that, that hauling these things from point A to point B can get to be very costly. Then, of course, the economics, it boils down to, look, this is a wish list. This is what I want, but I have a limited budget. So let's go with, with what I can afford initially, and then as time goes on and we prove concept, then maybe some of these other ancillary things that were mentioned uh, could be added on. So I, I think uh, that's exactly the point that we were trying to get across, or the points. So now let's just open it up to questions. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Jason. Um, while we're waiting on a couple of questions to come in, we do have some that are in, but we'll give uh, folks just a few more seconds to, to get their questions typed in, please use the Q&A tool on your WebEx control panel in lieu of the chat feature, if at all possible, so we can make sure that um, 
the expert panel can uh, access the question, um, and we'll have that at a later date uh, as well. Uh, would like to uh, uh, reiterate, if you will, uh, that today's presentation has been recorded and it will be available for uh, viewing and or downloading the PDF version on the Cleaver Brooks website. Uh, this should be uh, maybe uh, less than 24 hours. It, it'll be up there, uh, around 24 hours at the most. And I would also like to uh, remind you that all of our archived webinars are located at cleaverbooks.com forward slash webinars, and we have a survey upon exiting uh, WebEx for you, and if you will be so kind as to fill that out and give us your feedback, as well as other topics you would like to hear from Cleaver Brooks, we'll uh, see if we can't get that worked into our next calendar year uh, presentation schedule. All right. Um, this question, Jason or Steve, uh, pipe in either or, was asked, uh, a little bit earlier in the presentation. What are some of the concerns with a membrane type construction versus the refractory? Go ahead, Jason. Well, yeah, I can certainly speak to that. Um, most of the manufacturers are moving away from refractory construction, um, not, not just for maintenance, but for safety. Um, the membrane construction is fully welded uh, type of construction where there's no gas seals. Um, that are formed by refractory or, or even uh, like, like refractory backed by uh, like a, a liner. Um, so it eliminates the, the concern for there to be an accidental um, um, gas leak because the boiler vessel is 100% welded shut. The, the other thing uh, with membrane construction versus refractory is the older refractory construction required a, 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 an inner casing and an outer casing because inner casing would form the gas seal that the refractory couldn't. And then there was a secondary casing that was kind of a backup to that in case that failed due to overheating. So the membrane construction eliminates that completely, and it's all water-cooled, uh, as in cooled by the water circulating through the boiler. So it's a major advantage um, from eliminating those kind of concerns. But also, refractory is a big safety issue because if you have a boiler trip, and let's say so the boiler shuts off, the refractory, especially on the burner throat, it's, it's red hot. It's glowing. It's white hot even. And uh, if you have a leaky fuel valve, uh, for instance, you can have a pretty bad situation where that will cause a boiler explosion or, or at least a, a puff, we sometimes call it, at a minimum, which will, which will damage your boiler. And uh, eliminating the refractory removes that problem. So uh, hopefully that answered uh, the question. Okay, thanks, um, Jason. And then um, along with that kind of, uh, what is the advantage of additional membrane wall? Uh, the advantage of additional membrane walls? Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, it's just, uh, it, it also allows for, uh, you, I, I, I'm just going to assume that you're talking about uh, adding the front and rear membrane. Uh, what it does is it allows for a much cooler furnace and, uh, and uh, it basically decreases the amount of emissions. And, and that's the emissions is driving this, also driving this reduction in refractory. It's kind of a win-win on all fronts. It, refractory, uh, getting rid of it eliminates maintenance, uh, it improves safety, and it lowers emissions because the refractory re radiates heat back into the furnace, and that causes what's called thermal knocks in the combustion process. So by making all the walls membrane, um, you, you kind of solve all those problems all at once. Okay, and uh, next question, um, we talked about a D-type boiler, but how does the D-O and A-type boiler compare in efficiency? Uh, Steve, if you don't mind, I'll... I'll no, go ahead. Right ahead. You're, you're on a roll. Good. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. That's one that I often get asked by specifying engineers. Uh, when it comes to boilers, you know, efficiency is all about heat recovery, right? So. The lower the flue gas exit temperature is to atmosphere, the higher the efficiency. And the way to reduce that gas temperature is by achieving more heat transfer inside the boiler, you know, or put simply to have more heating surface. So if you compare the three main types of boilers we talked about today, um, uh, you know, three of equal capacity, the A type has the highest heating surface, followed closely by the O, and then the D. So technically, uh, to answer your question, the A type has the highest efficiency. But that being said, for industrial water tube boilers, economizers, as I mentioned earlier, are nearly always utilized to boost efficiency. 
Now, this is because, as I mentioned, the relatively small, co you know, upfront capital cost of the economizer, you know, is very quickly offset by the fuel savings resulting from the two to three to four percent efficiency gain. So, in other words, the return on investment is a no-brainer. And with an economizer, you can target a stack temperature, um, you know, to achieve a desired efficiency. So, no matter the boiler you use. So, essentially, the economizer levels the playing field uh, for all three types of boilers. So. Unless you plan to operate without an economizer, you're, you're free to t pretty much choose whichever boiler best fits your space or process requirements, um, or shipping logistics, uh, importantly. But um, to ask which one is more efficient, if technically yes, the more heating surface, the more efficient the boiler, but w with the water tubes anyway, you almost always have an economizer, so it's kind of a moot point, if, if that answers your question. Okay, we got a few good more uh, good questions, but I am getting some about the uh, certificates of um, participation. Uh, yes, we do provide certificates. If you did not indicate on your registration, be sure that you email us at marketing at cleaverbrooks.com uh, and request a certificate of participation or certificate of completion, and we'll be sure to get that to you. Um, that being said, let's see, Jason, we have time for just a, a couple more. I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, here's one, and you tell me if we need to get back to them at a later date. We have three boilers in which one may need to be replaced. Original Raleigh coal burners converted to natural gas, number two fuel oil. At times, all three would be in parallel operation. How would the replacement of one boiler with a new boiler be integrated with the other two remaining boilers? And what considerations do you need to, uh, do we need to address? Well, we'd certainly want to look at, um, uh, as far as con control standpoint, a plant master system of some kind if there's not already one in place. And then we would definitely have to look at, I, did you, was there part of the question involving a common stack? Is that, did I hear that? Uh, oh. Not in this question. Uh, okay, so that, but that would, if, depending on whether or not there's a common stack, uh, that would uh, definitely be something we can look at. It, We'd be happy to um, chat with you about that application. Okay, if you can common get stack is true, Jason. Just got confirmed. Uh, common stack is true. Common stack for all all the units. So yeah, we'd have to look at a uh, draft control system and some isolation dampers for each uh, each of the boilers, or at least for the new one, if the other ones don't already have them. Uh, and uh, we can certainly that's a, that'd be a great example to do a whole other webinar on uh, uh, for that because that's not uncommon either. So uh, if you want to get in touch with um, I guess my information is on the screen still, I think. So um, it is. feel free to email me uh, on that. I, I, I don't want to type the whole webinar on this, but it, there's a lot of things to look at, and we can do an analysis and figure out what makes the most sense. Okay. And uh, I'm going to give this to Steve if you want to take this one. Um, when we set up the, the scenario, we're using a water tube and not a fire tube, which temp, uh, seems to be less expensive. Um, and more efficient. Why are we using a water tube instead of a fire tube? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that, but that's a very, very good question as well. Uh, a fire tube, uh, you know, I'm talking now size for size, capacity for capacity, uh, is going to be more efficient, and it's going to be less expensive than a water tube boiler is. Uh, it's more efficient until you put that economizer on the water tube boiler, and then it's about a horse apiece. Uh, the other problem is that we have some, some real distinct issues going on with this, uh, this particular scenario. And we've got some rapid pressure decays going on, some rapid load swings, and a water tube boiler, because it doesn't have the heating surface, it's going to respond much more quickly. The circulation ratio in a water tube is much, much higher than a fire tube. So it's going to respond to those changes uh, much more effectively. The other thing is, of course, we're talking 200,000 pounds per hour. I'd have to have like five fire tubes to be able to accommodate this particular load. So space becomes an issue, and then, of course, cost would uh, be much higher for the five versus the one. Uh, so that's why we, we chose a water tube in this particular application. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, either or on this one, uh, Jason or Steve. If old coal-fired boiler was oversized, the stack was two. The new boiler will need a smaller flue to achieve adequate velocity and plume rise. Also, will need new emissions monitoring. How would you achieve adequate draft and velocity? 
Boy, I, I tell you, I, I can start on this one, uh, Jason. That That is an excellent point. And, uh, you know, what we talked about, of course, is you'd have to take look inside that stack. And what the what the uh, what this particular person is saying is that you've got a lot of draft in here. So you either have to have draft control if that stack is in good shape, and which means we don't have a lot of acid attack because of condensation and so on, a lot of fouling and spalling and so on. Then, of course, um, if we've got a good one, then we could be looking at, at draft control. If not... Then what we would do is we would recommend a liner that would go inside that masonry chimney adequately sized to give us the draft that we need. So um, that was an excellent question, a, a, a very good point taken. All right. Let me see if I can get this question right then. Um, with large yeah, and, I, and I, rapid I, – go ahead. Did you want to add? Well, I just uh, wanted to add one thing to that okay. is, is that we would uh, – and we in, include a draft control system as well. Um, so even if the stack is oversized a little bit, um, a draft damper on the flue uh, before the gases exit to the stack can be used to control the furnace pressure and make sure that uh, everything's okay. Um, but it sounds like you need a probably need a, a much smaller diameter to get the velocity you need. So just just a little note there. Go ahead, Susan. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, with large and rapid load fluctuations, when would multiple small boilers be indicated? Mm, that that would be, I'll tell you, that would be tough to control, and and that's why. Yeah. In, in this particular situation, I don't think I don't think the answer is small boilers necessarily. Uh, I think we have to have anticipatory controls out there, transmitters that are going to sense the the decay and get a signal back to the master control as quickly as possible so that that boiler, or you might have two boilers, can begin to modulate maybe in unison to be able to catch that, uh, catch that load. So I think it's really the, the solution to that particular problem is not multiple boilers. It's anticipating the load and the pressure decay and then reacting accordingly with a, uh, a, a boiler that's got sufficient turndown to be able to um, either increase or decrease the firing rate depending upon the load change. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, the water tube boiler will easily do 20% per minute uh, change in ramp rate. So if, if you do need better than that, um, there, are, there are ways to improve that with the control systems uh, and even sometimes putting a, a, like a steam uh, accumulator somewhere where you can kind of have a, a buffer, a, a big, big tank full of steam uh, to use up uh, temporarily when you have a load change can also help. So. That can be put out. That's in the true. It, somewhere. It, and, and the other thing is, depending upon the condition, sometimes we talk about summer boilers. And because, uh, you know, we, we said in this particular scenario that in the wintertime, because it was a Midwest uh, canner, uh, they had a heating load. Well, in the summer, that goes away. So y it might be most economical in that particular case to look at some smaller, they could be fire tube boilers, that would be handling certain loads um, that may vary but certain loads during the summertime. Uh, so there's a number of ways to skin the cat here, but uh, and it's got to be thought through, you know, very precisely in, in, in conversation with the, with the customer to find out really what's going on with that process load. Yeah, one more way to skin the cat would be to, to, to do two boilers, for instance, and you could base load one of them, and you can have another one on swing, and then if it's bad enough, you can sw you could start to modulate the base load boiler too. But uh, so you kind of you would effectively double your ramp rate um, from 20 to 40 percent per minute with two units. But uh, to go too many more than that, like Steve said, boy, it becomes a control nightmare. They start fighting each other. So. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. One last question. Um, if we didn't get a chance to get to your question, what we'll do, and because of time. Uh, these questions are recorded, and we can uh, very much get back to you uh, after the webinar uh, on any questions that we weren't able to take live. Uh, but last question, Steve and Jason, is there a relationship between heating surface and fan horsepower? Mm. Boy, I, I don't know of one. Do you, Jason? Uh, no, actually there is. Um, this is a good question because, and one that I think every consulting engineer should think about. Um, I'm actually glad you asked this because the answer is yes, um, especially for package boilers with forced draft fans like we're talking about today anyway. 
Um, the reason is that these kind of boilers have to fit within a finite shipping envelope, so you can only pack so much heating surface into a given space before the restriction starts to overcome the ability of or the rating of the fan. So for industrial water tube boilers, uh, at least, heating surface is formed by the tubes that are filled with the boiler feed water that absorb heat to produce steam. So since we have a, only a given um, space to ship this boiler, uh, you can only put too many of these tubes in it. So if you pack them too closely together, um, a larger fan will be required to force the gases through. So on paper, the heating surface of the boiler will look very high, um, but it will be at the expense of the fan horsepower or, or power consumption. Uh, and arguably, that's more important than heating service because that's an ongoing cost for the lifetime of the boiler. So very, a lot of consulting engineers um, try to specify or even select a boiler with as much heating service as, as they can. And while that's not a bad thing, I just want to make sure to point out that the more heating surface you have, the more restriction you're going to have in an industrial water tube boiler anyway, and therefore the higher fan horsepower. So, and with especially with these ultra low NOx uh, boilers nowadays, you need a lot more uh, mass flow through the boilers to achieve the same the lower NOx level. So, uh, it, it becomes a big problem. And uh, there are cases uh, where you need to remove some tubes or heating service from the boiler in order to uh, get the fan horsepower in a reasonable range and still um, have an economical boiler. So um, what I'm trying to say is, yes, there's a relationship between heating service and fan horsepower. The more heating service you have, uh, the higher the fan horsepower can be in, in a given outline, in a given uh, dimension. Uh, so it, simply evaluating a boiler by its heating surface alone does not really provide a complete, complete picture of the client, in my opinion. And then actually, in some cases, it's kind of doing them a disservice because if you go with a whole bunch of heating surface and they got a you know, 500 horsepower fan when they could have got away with a 300 horsepower fan and got the same boiler performance, then, you know, that didn't do anybody any good other than it looked good on paper. So um, that, that, I guess I'm, that's kind of a, a question that's near and dear to my heart because uh, I, get, I run into that quite a bit. So I'm glad whoever asked that, uh, that was a very good question. I hope, I hope it made sense, my answer. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I hope that you will tune back in with us on January the 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern for Routine Boiler Maintenance Ensures Reliability, Efficiency, and Safety. You can go to the Cleaver Books website and get a brief description of what we will cover under that topic. And again, send in those topics, fill out their surveys, and uh, give us some feedback. Appreciate it again, and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. And until next time, thanks, Jason, and thanks, Steve, as always. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks. Lots of things going on there.